production and research methods. What is psychology? It's the scientific key part to the definition of psychology. Think of it like this. Psychological science, it, we collect and evaluate information using systematic observations and measurements. Behavior is anything that we do that can be directly observed as well as recorded. So for an example, you could think about crying, you could think about hitting or even sleeping. Those are different type of behaviors. Mental processes are those private internal experiences, our thoughts, our feelings, memories that really can't be observed directly. However, for your uh, studying, please know that the answer to what is psychology is the scientific study of behavior and mental processes. Now, this is going to be found in your assignments. Um, say, take a minute to pause and allow yourself to answer true or false to any of these questions. Pretty much just to let you know, these are questions that we've actually asked in terms of research. Uh, these are areas that's actually been researched and followed. So take a moment and think to yourself exactly what would be true and what would be false. Now, when we talk about pseudo-psychology, this is based on more about common folk beliefs, folk type wisdoms, as well as superstitions that's generally formed from unsupported type of information and usually won't follow the basics of empirical testing and research. In the picture, you see the amazing Randy, magician James Randy, and what he did was he dedicated his life to educating the public about fraudulent pseudo-psychologists, along with uh, the prestigious MacArthur uh, Foundation, Randy kind of offered $1 million, and I think he actually upped it since then to $10 million, to anyone who can prove a genuine psychic power under proper observation um, or observing conditions. And I mean, he's done this so long, after many years, the money was never collected from. Uh, you could go to YouTube and you can see uh, different times when people attempted to get the money and he was able to prove uh, that they were not real. Uh, for further information, do visit his website. He has one um, at www.randy.org. Again, you'll learn more about his quest to prove that psychics are not real. But more or less, pseudo-psychology is when it's those appearances that looks like it might be science, but it's really not. So some of the uh, different categories that might fall upon within this would be psychics, the mediums, those who says that they, you know, they can uh, do the paranormal or they can uh, contact those who have transcended, uh, those who say they can read the palm of your hand and tell you how your life may be, as well as astrologers. Now, let me just give this one point though in terms of astrology. Astrology has their own scientific methods in terms of reading the stars. However, it is not a psychological component, okay? That's the major difference. Now, in terms of psychology, psychologists go by four goals. This is, uh, this is our Bible. This is what we work upon uh, in terms of what we're looking for, okay? The first one would be described. And more or less, when I talk about describe, I'm talking about how is the what of, what type of behaviors or mental processes are actually going on. Then we will attempt to explain and when we say explain, what we're doing in this concept is we're saying why a behavior or a mental process may happen in the first place. 
so as you can see with the uh, examples that they're showing, uh, one way of saying explanation, research indicates that there are a number of interacting causes or explanations for aggression, which would include culture, learning, genes, brain damage, and high levels of testosterone. So that's how we would start explaining those different types of behaviors. Once we've been able to say what or describe and then explain a behavior or mental process, then we attempt to predict whether or not a behavior will occur again. Okay, so that's the win. So in this sentence, you'll see it's saying that knowing that alcohol leads to increased aggression, we can predict that more fights will erupt in places where alcohol is consumed than in those where alcohol isn't consumed. Know that and understand, <clears throat> excuse me, you'll be needing to look for key words within sentence structures. And you'll see in a few minutes, I have another part of the assignment that I want you to work on, um, what I'm talking about. Finally, the whole purpose of us in psychology and working with people and working with behaviors as well as mental processes is hoping to be an agent of change. That's the how. How can we change one's behavior or one's mental process? Okay, so moving on. Now this is something that I want you to stop and I want you to take out a piece of paper. Okay, you'll pause this video and then answer these questions for yourselves. Okay, and see if you can get it right. And once you start doing your reading, you'll know whether or not you have the answers right or wrong. And I will place them somewhere in Canvas for you to find. I like to do scavenger hunts. Anyway, <laughs> the first one, I'll read them out loud so you can kind of have an understanding. And hopefully, I'll pick up on the uh, cues. Research. Researchers have recently identified a gene that predisposes certain individuals to become obese because their satiety mechanism doesn't turn on. Which of the four would that be? Number two, some developmental psychologists, they believe <clears throat> that many more playground accidents will occur this year among young children who watch violent cartoons. Which of the four would that be? Number three, comprehensive sex education should be required in all high schools because studies demonstrate that such education has reduced the teenage pregnancy rate. Which of the four would you choose? And then finally, number four, Surveys show that women who graduate from college earns, <clears throat> excuse me, as much money per year as men who graduate from high school. Which of the four would it be? So take a moment, write down your answers, go back and read if you need to, go back to, uh, you can also find, I'm sorry, you can look at the slides because the PowerPoint slides is also on uh, Canvas. So if you need to open that up so that you can see the slide individually, by all means do so. But take a look and write down your responses and then find the answers on Canvas. All right. So in psychology, a psychologist can wear many different hats, and there are many different career paths psychologists can take, okay? I, have you ever wondered why, if you like an uh, education major, if, or you're a criminal justice major, or biology major, why general psychology is considered a mandatory course? Well, that's because psychology flows throughout every discipline dealing with human nature and behaviors and working with mental processes is found through all. So just to give you an example, these are some of the different type of career paths that people that's in uh, the field of psychology may or can take. 
that being by bio, uh, biopsychology as well as neuroscience. If you are a bio major or if you're within chemistry, guess what? This might be an area that would interest you. Clinical psychology, which that's my specialization. By trade, I'm a clinical psychologist. That's what I did my training in. And more or less, more or less, we work on doing evaluation, being able to do diagnosis, doing treatment, as well as looking and working um, with the different psychological disorders. Cognitive psychology, here we're looking at the mental processes specifically and how we would uh, be able to think, how our memory is, our level of intelligence, as well as <clears throat> ability to speak or our language capabilities, as well as creativity. In terms of comparative psychology, now this is where we're looking more into that research area, okay? This is when we're taking a look at behavior and mental processes in terms of animals, um, non-human uh, humans, which we would look at evolution as well as how cross species and how there might be some similarities or differences. In terms of counseling psychology, now this is the area that's kind of have some similarities with clinical psychology. However, more or less, they're looking at the disordered individuals and they're looking more about the social, educational, as well as career adjustments for a person. In terms of a clinical psychologist, we might do that, but our emphasis would be more in starting the process through assessment and evaluations and looking directly at diagnoses and being able to diagnose a person. We do therapy though. Okay. Now with cross-cultural psychology, this is when we're looking at similarities and differences amongst the different cultures. And we do comparisons. Other terms that's been used for cross-cultural psychology interchangeably has been multicultural psychology. Then you have developmental psychology. Now this is when we're looking at how one goes throughout the lifespan from infancy and actually prenatal. At the time of conception, we would, uh, a developmental psychologist could start right there all the way to the end of life. Educational psychology, for those who's majoring in education, here we're looking at the processes of how one learns how to be able to promote that intellectual, social, as well as emotional development within children in the school environment so that you can enhance their learning experiences. Environmental psychology is looking at how people react and act within a particular environment, physical environment. Experimental psychology, that's where they're digging in about looking at learning and conditioning, how one adapts, how one becomes motivated, uh, one's perceptions in terms of how, uh, what consequences or what uh, variables might impact and affect a person. Moving on, as you can see, again, the sample is vast. Forensics, are you a criminal justice major? Well, forensic psychology might be something you're looking for. I know a lot of students when, um, having face-to-face -face classes have expressed and shared that they want to go into the FBI and they would like to do like what they see on the show Criminal Minds um, in which they're using forensic psychology to be able to catch their perpetrators. So this is something that would be, uh, might be up your alley. That's because what they're doing is they're taking the principles of psychology and they're aligning it with the legal system and it can include not only just trying to do profiling with uh, perpetrators, but it also includes working with wanting to know what a potential juror member might be thinking. It can look at uh, how to assess the individual to see whether or not that they can uh, competent to be able to stand trial and that list can go on. Then we have what we call gender and cultural psychology. And this is when we're looking at uh, men and women, particularly the genders, uh, and how they react within different cultures, how there might be similarities as well as differences. Those who are in biology and chemistry, 
health psychology can also be a field that you can um, utilize because we're looking at the biological as well as psych uh, psychological and social factors that would um, impact one's health or might contribute to one's illness. As we go throughout the semester, we'll be talking about different areas like stress, and we've all dealt with stress, and we can look and you'll hear more about health psychology in that aspect. Now with industrial organizational type of um, psychology, here we're taking psychology and we're looking at it in the workplace. Uh, think about the classrooms you sit in. Uh, you notice here uh, at Jackson State, most of our classrooms, we have pretty plain rooms, don't we? Well, more or less, what research has been able to demonstrate is that if we can keep your mind focused on the task at hand by removing any type of distractions, then it might elevate and help you with the learning process. An industrial organizational psychologist would have been the one to have made those type of suggestions. In terms of uh, personality psychology, now we're looking at the unique and uh, the patterns that would make an individual either stable or unstable in terms of how they think, how they feel, the actions that they take, um, whether that be, you know, uh, a personality that's with strong-willed, a personality that might be disruptive. There's different traits that can be attributed to it. And a personality psychologist, they would look into that specifically. Uh, a more recent uh, development in psychology has been positive psychology. And when I say recent, it's been around for about 20, 25 years, but it's still considered a newbie in some aspects. And pretty much what's happening here is we're looking at what makes a person content in life and kind of focusing on what makes the optimum uh, belief system a person who's happy and how to maintain that. School psychology, again, with education, here we're looking at how we can collaborate with teachers, parents, and students, how to be able to help children needs in terms of if there's any uh, challenges or disabilities. Social psychology, we're looking at how social uh, forces within our inner and intrapersonal behaviors would be in terms of how we love biases or prejudice and looking at how one might conform or non-conform to societal rules, as well as different attitudes. And then sports psychology. Now, are you an athlete? Play football, do, uh, soccer, baseball, any of the athletics? Well, you might be interested in sports psychology because here we're taking the principles of psychology to help enhance physical performance. In looking at the historical um, inferences, psychology's past include these three <clears throat> dynamics, that being structuralism, functionalism, and this psychoanalytic school. Now with structuralism, this was established established model for studying mental processes scientifically, okay? It was to be able to help identify the structures or what we talk about as building blocks of one's mental life. And usually that's been through introspection, how we think about ourselves internally um, and how we've been able to combine that with our life experiences. In terms of functionalism, this expanded that scope of psychology to help include research on one's emotions as well as observable behaviors. What it did was initiate the psychological testing movement and help to influence modern education as well as the industry. Then this is what I call actually the art of psychology. There's been big debate uh, in terms of uh, the psychoanalytic school, and, but this was more art than scientific. And we'll talk more further about that beyond. But the psychoanalytic school was actually founded by Sigmund Freud. And what he did was he was able to provide a basis for this system of therapy, which was known as psychoanalysis. 
that actually was then to move further into what we now call psychodynamics and then there's other different branches that we'll talk about later on in the semester. So now, in terms of today, there's seven perspectives that's been the basis that's utilized to, for many different psychologists. Okay, as I mentioned, psychodynamic, that branched off of psychoanalytic. And what we're looking at there is the unconscious drives, motives, as well as conflicts. And generally speaking, Floyd's belief was, is that if you didn't resolve certain issues or make certain, uh, get past certain stages within your childhood, was that you, these conflicts would have difficulty later on in life. So pretty much some of the things that we looked at in terms of research would be one's personality traits in adulthood, as well as any type of problems that might have impacted one's adulthood based upon early childhood experiences. Then you have behavioral. In this perspective, this is where it's strictly by the actions that you take is what a behavioralist look at. They don't care too much about your emotions or how you think you feel or thinking, even though we have some that spend off into cognitive behavioral. But with a pure behavioralist, they look at the actions one do. And it's got to be objective, observable, generally speaking, how the environment might impact it. And it's looking at those overt type of behaviors. Okay. So some of the uh, research uh, questions that would come up here is how one might be able to uh, learn both good and bad habits, okay? Or how uh, we might work toward increasing good behavior as well as getting rid of those that we don't want uh, a person to have. The humanist approach, which was Carl Rogers, is, is one of the theorists that's strong from this, looks um, as well as Abraham Maslow. With this approach, they're looking at one's free will, the ability for, um, to try to reach self-actualization, as well as going, uh, going with the human nature and making it the major focus in terms of how we live and how we interact with one another. It's being able to build upon a person's uh, contentment in life and helping them to understand how they develop and how they can enhance oneself. Now, when we talk about cognitive, the main concept, again, looking at the word cognitive, is how the thinking process is in terms of thinking, being able to problem solve, how you perceive things in life, how your memory takes in things, and sometimes our memory is not always good, but this is things that might be uh, considered, as well as information uh, processing and how um, our language is developed. The biological is going to look now more at the genetic structures, as well as your biological processes that's uh, coming with from your brain, as well as other parts of the nervous system, and how it helps us to be able to react um, or not. We'll talk about those different systems and you'll hear me talk about fight or flight, but we'll get into that later. Now evolutionary is a perspective where we're looking more about natural selection. It's not, it's not the survival of the fittest, not in that same term that everybody usually think of when we hear natural selection, but it's more about how we fit on earth how we might adapt and how from adapting we grow and evolve. We look at that and how it impacts and influences our behaviors as well as our mental processes in that aspect. Last but not least would be the social cultural. Now here we're talking more about ones interacting with other people and how the way our culture helps to determine our development in terms of our behaviors as well as mental processes, because we all have a different way of living, right? Uh, how you may have been taught different things would be different simply because of your culture.
So now what I want to do is I'm going to now delve a little deeper into those seven perspectives that I discussed, okay? First up on board, let's talk about the biopsychosocial model. With biological processes like our genetics and brain functions, our neurotransmitters, as well as evolution, psychological factors, when we're looking at that, we're talking more about learning, thinking, our emotions, one's personality as well as motivations. In terms of social forces, now this is looking at family as well as school and culture, in terms of one's ethnicity as well as your social class, and the politics that might uh, influence your life. The biopsychosocial model pretty much unifies and integrates different models. We used to call it being eclectic, but eclectic wasn't a great word to hear because it's, it just made it sound like a hodgepodge. When in reality, those influences that go across the board is really important to consider because not everybody is going to fit in one mold. So the biopsychosocial model pretty much allows us to review and look at biological processes, psychological factors, as well as social influences, and how those interactions can actually allow us to better help the individual. Now, getting into the nitty gritty, the science of psychology. There are different types of research, and the two types of research we're going to look at in this particular chapter will be basic research and applied research. When we talk about basic research, now this is typically things you might have already experienced being here at Jackson State. It's usually conducted in universities or um, research labs. Um, and pretty much you're interested in advancing general scientific understandings, having that knowledge for its own sake that's kind of without uh, known real world uses. There'll be discoveries that links aggression, for example, to testosterone, or it can be genes and how or how we learn, as well as different factors that comes from basic research. With this particular type of uh, research, in terms of our four goals, you would be able to describe as well as explain and also to be able to predict different behaviors. Now, in terms of the applied research, now we're looking at something different. This is generally going to be conducted outside of a laboratory and it's going to help us with our fourth goal, that being change. <clears throat> so, in terms of this, applied research has been able to design different programs that would help with like conflict resolution, as well as therapies and counseling. Uh, when I talked about uh, criminal justice earlier and talking about perpetrators, think about those who have been victims of violence. These are different areas that we have been able to use research to help to generate change in how we approach as well as help individuals or victims, as well as perpetrators. Yes, we do help those who um, are in need um, that demonstrates those uh, violent type behaviors. We definitely wanna help change that behavior from them acting violently towards somebody to being able to learn how to cope. So it's also you know, been really helpful in terms of talking about safety and designing um, for that purpose, as well as, uh, as the applied research also help in other areas, that being in safety and design in automobiles and airplanes, how we've been able to use it for stovetop burners, even cell phone usage. So there's been many different ways that we've been able to take applied research and help us change how we live. Now, the scientific method, think of it as something being silico and cumulative. It's a scientific progression, and it comes from repeatedly challenging and revising theories that's already existing and being able to build on new ones, okay? 
when we talk about meta-analysis, now we're talking about the different type of studies that might show some contradiction, okay? And what researchers would do on average is try to combine or, or the results of such studies and then reach different conclusions that would provide an overall, overall weight um, of the evidence um, collected. Theories, these are evidence-based and they're gonna be subjected to rigorous testing. In psychology, we don't just take it at face value. We delve and dig deep to kind of figure out just what is really going on, why it's happening, we, of course, use those four and describing, explaining, predicting, and changing. We're going to work all within that, and that's considered evidence-based. So using the <clears throat> this slide to help you, pretty much we start like this. If I did a, a, a research project and I wanted to find out uh, about aggression, that's been the overall uh, consensus on the slides. One of the things I'm going to do is I have to come up with a question. And with that question, why do young males show aggressive behaviors? Well, we start off with the question and then we work toward a literature review. That literature review is going to help show you either that we already have a lot of information out there, or if there's nothing out there, that your question needs to be delved in further. What it turns into, how we now have the cycle building, is that we'll look at it and we generate what we call a testable hypothesis. What we're doing now is we're trying to look at uh, the question and we break down into what we feel would be a prediction of how to answer the question. From there, we're going to do a research design. From that research design, we'll develop some instruments. It could be questionnaires, it can be uh, interviews, and so forth, of how we get to the answer. Data collection and analysis is pretty much taking the design we made, if it was a questionnaire, for example, or a survey, and gathering information, getting how other people might answer the question, and then um, analyzing that information. Once we come up with what we feel is a strong evidence-based answer, then we want to share it. So that comes into publication. From that, peer reviews and People might grab hold and start saying, yeah, this is something that I think we can use and be utilized for psychology as a whole, meaning that we might now have what we call theory development. So that's the cycle and how we go into what we call the scientific method. Now, here's some of the terms that I want you to go ahead and make sure you study and, and kind of get locked into your head. First one being hypothesis. Again, this is when we're talking about that question, but now it's a specific testable prediction. That hypothesis is a prediction about how you factor in or what variables is going to be related to one another. An operational definition would say that pre precise type of de uh, description of how the variables within a study will be observed and measured. So for this exa um, example, we'll talk about how drug abuse can be operationally defined as, might say, the number of missed days um, from work or school due to excessive use of, of an addictive substance. And then you have what we call statistical significance. Now we're talking about a statistical statement of the likelihood that this study can be uh, looked at and it's not just merely happening by chance, but it's actually a more valid and reliable tool to be able to help us with prediction. Now there's ethical concerns throughout and you may have heard different stories um, of uh, situations in which research wasn't done well and the person wasn't uh, considered 
in terms of, if you might have heard for one, like the Tuskegee um, experiment and how people were uh, poorly uh, treated or not treated in the terms of Tuskegee. Um, but how from that, we've come up and realized that we have to make psychology accountable for the actions. And thus we have what we call ethics. And there's three specific areas um, that I want to just talk to you about today. The first being respecting rights of human participants. When we talk about research, we have to respect the person. We can't just treat them any kind of way. One thing we always try to do is we request for what we call informed consent. We want to make sure the person is willing to work with us. Um, uh, so the informed consent is that first research principle that helps in uh, allowing us to initiate our experiment. We can't do it without people, but we need to make sure that they understand that it's a voluntary type of participation. They should be able to know uh, the nature of the study. They should know what's going on as far as significant factors that's going to be able to, that might influence if whether or not they even want to do it. So it might, you know, that can include things like physical risk, if there's any type of discomfort, if there's some unpleasant emotional experiences involved. And a person should never feel that they're forced to have to, once they sign on a dotted line, that they're forced to do this study. At any time, if you ever decide to participate, know that at any time you can stop, okay? In terms of, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> in terms of restricted use of deception and debriefing, mm -hmm. a lot of people feel that they shouldn't be, but there are times, um, and I'd like for you to think about why would we have to use deception in research? Well, restricted use of deception and debriefing is when the participants, they, they have to know the true purpose behind certain studies, but if they do, then they might not respond naturally to it. So there are times when we need to deceive participants um, to the actual design and the reason for the research. However, uh, when deception is used, there are really strict and important guidelines that a researcher has to do, as well as restrictions that may apply. This really includes that debriefing. We need to debrief participants at the end of the experiment. So we can't tell you uh, some uh, differences and not never let you know what we were really looking for. Debriefing involves explaining those reasons for being able to conduct the research that way, as well as clear up any type of uh, misconceptions or questions or concerns that a participant <clears throat> may have. Last but not least is talking about confidentiality. Now, all information that's acquired uh, about people during a study, it has to be kept private and not to be published in any way that an individual's rights to privacy will be compromised. So pretty much the way uh, when we're doing research, say for example, you wanted to take part in a survey. Now that researcher should be explaining to you that at no time will they be publishing anything about your name, where you live, or uh, your ethnicity or so forth. Um, any type of clues that's going to allow someone to figure it out that it's you. Rather, most times what happens is a number is assigned and the data that's collected is not shared with anyone except if it's a student, the uh, supervising or uh, the instructor may see it and that has to be told to the participant prior to them doing uh, the research, so the experiment. Now, the second area of concern is respecting the rights of non-human animal participants. Now, in the past, we've heard so many horror stories about how animals are treated so poorly during research. Well, in terms of psychology, we have our ethical uh, concerns uh, 
or rather not concerns, but we have been uh, moved toward not hurting animals that way, not just using it in um, reckless ways. Non-human animals and medical research, it does allow us to be able to test things like new drugs or new surgical procedures, as well as different methods for relieving pain. Um, in terms of psychological research, we've used non-human animals uh, to lead in uh, significant advances that would help in every aspect of psychology. That includes how the brain might work within animals and being able to do comparative studies with humans as well as their nervous system, looking at health and stress, um, talking about in terms of sensation and perception, one's sleeping patterns, learning abilities, memory, and the list goes on. Uh, the gains for animals, non-human uh, animal research has been able to produce large gains for animals themselves. One example would be that more natural environments for uh, zoo animals uh, have been able to be generated because of it. Successful breeding techniques, um, being able to uh, help endangered species, all came from that as well. So ethical questions that might arise and still will arise is using non-human animals in psychological research, it's still going to be controversial. Okay, but in the meantime, we do try to take, you know, great care in how we handle animals during research. We're actively seeking for new and better ways to be able to protect animals uh, so that we are not needlessly hurting them. Third area of ethical concerns would be respecting the rights of psychotherapy clients. Here again, we're, we're making sure that we keep hold to one's confidentiality. We try not to break it, but there may be times when we actually do. What do you think would be the times when we have to actually break one's confidentiality? Well, the main thing would be if a person is, uh, appears to be a harm to themselves or to others, we are mandated, obligated to be able to report that uh, particularly to law enforcement um, or to party, other parties that would be involved. So it's not that um, they'll do it because just because, but if they show significant evidence that they might want to kill themselves or they claim that they're going to kill someone else and they give us all the information, then yeah, we have to report that. We can't just keep that to ourselves. Now, I'm going to stop here. I would like for you to continue doing your reading of chapter one, um, and then we'll come back in the next video uh, talking more about experimental research and looking at uh, cause and effect. Thanks for listening.